It's a pleasure to welcome Ray Doswell with us, who is the Vice President and Curator of the Negro Leagues Museum in Kansas City. Ray, thank you for joining the Johnny and Josh Show. Glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, it's been a historic week for social justice and sports in the United States, as we all know. Uh, we will discuss that, but I'd like to, if it's okay, begin with the Negro League Museum, uh, baseball museum, which began in 1991 as a one-room office space and has since expanded to become quite the institution. Uh, for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about the museum and its mission. Well, actually, officially a museum uh, anniversary is September 1990. Um, some of our offices opened in 91. So this is our 30th anniversary year. Um, the museum grew from that small one room office uh, with some exhibits and photos expanded to a small exhibit area about 2,000 square feet in 1994 uh, and but with the goal of opening a larger space, which is where we are now, uh, takes up roughly 10,000 square feet in a 50,000 square foot complex um, with life-size bronze statues and hundreds of photographs uh, and artifacts related to African-American baseball from the late 1800s up through the 1960s. And we emphasize what was called the Professional Negro Leagues, uh, which lasted uh, from 1920 to 1960. Um, there was a meeting held in uh, February of 1920, uh, not far from here, a building, uh, a YMCA building on the Paseo Boulevard, which is just around the corner. Uh, and that, and uh, that meeting encompassed a number of uh, contemporary baseball team owners, black baseball team owners, and executives to form what would become the Negro National League. And this year marks the 100th anniversary of that meeting and we're celebrating the centennial uh, of that event. Um, the museum's been around as noted uh, for those times and we typically in an average year, this is an unusual year of course, uh, we welcome close to 60 to 70,000 visitors uh, uh, through our turnstiles uh, to learn the history of African Americans um, in sport uh, and how it connects to the larger black history story and American history story. And you mentioned uh, that the first Negro League began in 1920. So that is obviously the 100 year anniversary which we saw celebrated throughout Major League Baseball a few weeks back, and I, I, we saw patches and uh, Negro League uniforms featured prominently uh, on that day, and uh, game broadcasts were peppered with content to, to design, uh, you know, try to help increase awareness of this uh, important and extremely vital uh, era in baseball history. Uh, how did those celebrations go for the museum, and, and what did they mean? Well, to clarify historically, uh, that wasn't the first Negro Leagues per se. Uh, there were attempts to create leagues, and when we speak of leagues, we're, we're speaking of groupings of teams agreeing to play common opponents on a regular schedule, maybe some revenue sharing, uh, determine champions at the end of a completed season. And there were attempts to do that before, but none were as successful as this one. And when we think of the Negro Leagues historically, uh, the groupings of teams and business structure that came out of the meeting in Kansas City in 1920 is what has been universally recognized as the, 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 uh, the primary beginning of Negro Leagues baseball. Um, and I think the museum was very pleased with uh, the way uh, Major League Baseball has partnered with the museum to help mark that occasion. Of course, um, the pandemic had really derailed a number of grander plans that the museum and MLB had to mark the occasion. We were initially planning to have uh, an event in late June of this year, um, but the, the structure of the event was basically the same as what we did in August. Um, all the teams would, some, would wear a commemorative patch on their uniforms, uh, to recognize the centennial um, and uh, of course have various histories and activities surrounding that and the idea would be that teams and especially players would do uh, really a symbolic tip of the cap uh, of respect to the history of the Negro Leagues uh, and a lot of people would have hoped that 
teams would wear uh, the old classic uniforms of which some teams did and, and others have and some will still do actually. Uh, but I think it's powerful to have that patch on a Major League Baseball uniform. And it's hard to deny that, you know, the reason for the existence of the Negro Leagues is because back in those years, um, it was because of racism and segregation that kept African-American players out. But MLB understands the the pain of that history and wants to rectify that through the support of the museum and other initiatives that support African-Americans wanting to participate in the sport. Um, I was particularly pleased with a lot of the national coverage that we got, um, being able to have our president, Bob Kendrick, featured on the Sunday night uh, premier game as well. Um, I, myself and others, uh, uh, were able to go across the country, so to speak, virtually to talk about um, different aspects of the history. Um, and a number of, of uh, teams did a lot of extra work in promoting the history, uh, promoting the history in their communities, which is very important to us that people in those communities embrace their local history. And, and finally, um, I can't say enough about the players wanting to embrace the history. In a normal year, we would have players coming through as they're traveling to Kansas City and they want to learn the history. And I think uh, they've been embracing this history more and more and understanding, and not just African-American players, but white players and, and important to us too, Latino players, understanding their connections to this, this great past. What does it mean to you personally to, to be part of a, an institution that's become kind of a almost like a baseball pilgrimage for sports and for education to see players coming through and learning about the legacies of players such as Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige and Jackie Robinson, perhaps more importantly though, the players that we don't know because they could not make it to the major leagues despite having the talent. Well, that's very rewarding work for me. Um, I think a lot of people who I encounter uh, think I have one of the sexiest jobs in the world. I get to be around <laughs> baseball and occasionally get to meet celebrities and other things. And, and that's true that I, that does happen, but uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, grind of actually um, answering history questions and filing photographs and, and doing uh, research, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's work like anything else. Um, uh, at the same time, the rewards come from when people do recognize uh, that we're contributing something very important to the national discussion about understanding African American history, uh, and and that sports fans are awakened to something that they didn't know anything about, uh, and that people come in, they see the history, and they appreciate what we do. You know, I'm the curator here at the museum and I often liken myself to an umpire in a baseball game. Uh, ideally, if your game goes smoothly, it's because the officials are doing what they need to do and they're not noticed and everything goes smoothly. Uh, and that is my primary role here at the museum, to so make sure that the trains run on time and, and things are in place where they need to go, uh, both from uh, an understanding of getting information out, but also structurally, physically in our exhibits. Uh, and my role is to go out and see and solve problems sometimes. Uh, but when people say that they appreciate the experience, they appreciate the beauty of our museum, they appreciate what we're doing, uh, it does make you feel good. It's very rewarding. And um, I hope that uh, beyond this occasion of the centennial uh, that folks remember uh, those lessons and continue to pass those down to young people uh, and come back and, of course, support the museum in our vital work. You spoke about history, obviously, uh, throughout the United States. This has been a historic week uh, for social justice, in particular, the involvement uh, and the role that sports is playing. Um, we've seen boycotts. Uh, our games of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball, at least in my opinion, has been traditionally a socially conservative institution. And now we're seeing really unprecedented uh, boycotts, at least from Major League Baseball. Uh, in reaction to the events in Kenosha, the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, Dominic Smith, who was the Mets outfielder, was uh, extremely emotional after 
Wednesday's game and spoke about the challenges of uh, being a black person in the United States. Uh, on Thursday, the Mets and the Marlins walked off the field after bowing their heads for 42 seconds, which was a nod to Jackie Robinson, who, of course, wore 42. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on these events. Well, it is a very poignant watershed moment in um, American history. Uh, and yet, we've been here before, and those who study history under understand that. Um, but I'll try to explain. So here at the museum, we've been involved in these conversations for a long time as content providers of understanding the backdrop to uh, social justice and, and systemic racism in America. Not that we are experts in that and in understanding uh, the broader sociological and anthropological um, uh, issues tied to that, but we have a story to tell. And that story is of, of how African Americans in mostly urban settings were able to, um, to manage uh, racism and oppression. And, and what I like to say, broker their culture and their abilities uh, to great success. Uh, and in doing so, uh, through sport, help pave the way for integration in America. It's a story about the great migration in many respects of African Americans moving post-slavery, post the Reconstruction period in America uh, to urban areas and to the Midwest and to the North uh, to escape sharecropping and escape Jim Crow laws, even though they ran into some of those same issues as they moved North, um, uh, the way that they were able to manage racism, but build community uh, outside of the mainstream. Uh, the businesses, the, the clothing stores, the grocery stores, the banks, and among those businesses were baseball teams. Uh, and um, it's important for us to note that in the baseball circles, because I think it's pretty easy. You can go to a place, a beautiful place like the National Baseball Hall of Fame and be immersed in baseball if you're a baseball fan. Uh, it's a Shangri-La of people who wanted to be part of the game and we meet the pantheon of heroes that are there and we can be really romanticized by that. And you can come here and I think in some aspects we're kind of guilty of romanticizing baseball too in that every young boy in spite of their race or color wanted to play baseball. Uh, but at the same time you see some uncomfortable truths here as well. And the fact that this story has to exist in the first place should be an uncomfortable truth for everyone that the Negro Leagues had to exist in this way in those times. I mean, think about 100 years ago, uh, as we look at the centennial, America was coming uh, in from post-World War I, uh, a global pandemic of the so-called Spanish flu. Um, in 1919, as a result, in some cases of African-Americans who fought gallantly in World War I, and many black soldiers in particular, fighting for the rights that they feel they've earned uh, from having served their country, being met with virulent racism and the explosion of the bloody summer of 1919 with race riots in Texas and in St. Louis area, in East St. Louis and in Chicago in particular, uh, coming out of that. Um, and so we're seeing those parallels again a uh, hundred years later and the fact that we're still dealing with those issues and even uh, 50 plus years since the March, March on Washington, which was the anniversary this weekend as well, um, is, um, is something that is unfortunate. Uh, but we're here to teach those lessons to say, this is how we've come to this point. Uh, these are the issues that have not changed. Uh, we're dealing with those same issues and these baseball players were able to navigate that as best they could. It was, it were triumphant stories and tragic times. Uh, and uh, we're happy to play a role in that conversation if necessary. And we think too that sport um, can be for a lot of people a safe entree into discussing these issues. Uh, but what the players and the athletes have done, and particularly this week, uh, really puts it in the face of people um, to, uh, to pay attention. And I, and I hope they can continue playing, but I completely understand the need for a pause. 
Uh, and if that pause means taking any distractions away from that issue, which is, I think, their goal, uh, then folks hopefully will wake up and see that that message and truly pay attention, uh, not feel inconvenienced. Uh, these players are human beings with feelings and 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 want to see real change in America. And you hope that uh, events like this open the door to real change. Um, having said that, we are recording uh, this podcast on what is the rescheduled Jackie Robinson Day. That's Friday. Uh, also coincides, as you mentioned, with the 57th year anniversary of the March on Washington and Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, all at the same time that, that we uh, you know, tip our caps to Jackie Robinson and recognize what he did for African Americans in baseball and sport and society. Uh, baseball seems to be going in a kind of neutral to downward uh, direction when it comes to presence of players and uh, managers and upper management in baseball today. Uh, it's about 8% players on the field is the statistic cited. And back in 1981, the numbers and representation would have been, you know, in and around three times that. So why are we not seeing, why are we down from 1981? Why aren't we uh, triggering up representation amongst African Americans? That's a very good question. And I, and every Jackie Robinson day, no matter what time of year it is, we get asked that question. Um, and I've never claimed expertise on reasons. Um, I can tell you what has been told to me. I, I can assure you that MLB is very sensitive to this issue. Um, former officials with MLB have basically said that um, there is a lack of, there was a lack of interest in the game uh, and um, from those communities over the years and that they need to do something to increase that interest level and, and make sure that those opportunities are there. And that's the issue. Were opportunities being denied for young black players since the mid eighties to come into baseball? Some might say economically, yes, because of the, the, the evolution of, of youth baseball and how it has become a big business for some that in some respects, maybe has outpriced uh, the young black athlete who is uh, not to generalize a stereotype, but is that urban child who doesn't have access to resources to be able to do travel baseball and those kinds of things. That's one aspect of it. Uh, the aspect of the movement um, in the 70s and 80s of ballparks away from the urban core to suburban areas uh, or the outskirts of town. Uh, and if you, I mean, if you don't see yourself in the game, then why should you have interest in the game? Uh, baseball is very sensitive to that. Um, thus, there are no ways for these athletes to be fed through a system. There's no, there's, there's less of them playing youth baseball, and then there's less of them playing high school baseball. And and high school baseball in general is is. Um, is not always as supported for various reasons compared to the other sports over the years because that, that is a sport that uh, in some communities doesn't produce any kind of revenue and that trickles on to college where baseball with a few exceptions is not a revenue generating sport uh, so they don't have as many scholarships to give to athletes in general and especially young black athletes uh, and so then there's nothing to feed them into a minor league system as well uh, and that is why at least MLB has made aggressive uh, stand in building these baseball urban academies around the country we have one adjacent uh, to us here now um, where there's an opportunity for young people uh, to play baseball in the urban core. Um, so that's, that's another aspect of it. Um, and it, it's hard to, I don't like to distinguish between uh, our Latino players and black players because I think culturally there's much more in common than we have apart. But it is true that your American born black player at the same time in the 1980s, when it was at that height, 
and actually more even with our players from the Dominican and Puerto Rico and places like that. It started to go down after that point, and uh, the Latino population in baseball began to go up because they began to recruit those players more heavily uh, from a labor standpoint uh, and a financial development standpoint. It became uh, more lucrative for baseball to develop those players uh, in those foreign countries as it was to develop them in the United States. Um, um, but once a, a, a talented player gets into the system, improves his talent, then he can become a millionaire and really uh, save his family, save his village if he needs to. Uh, but uh, that emphasis was being put more in Latin America than it was in the United States and in the urban United States. And that's part of uh, baseball realized that. And that's why you see these urban academies as well. So uh, a lot of factors, a lot of things go into it. Uh, the the part that for some when they come to the baseball museum is that um, they can see on the walls in our museum the the number of black fans the number of black players black owners uh, black business people who love the game and invested in the game and were invested heavily in the game itself and black people have a stake in this game historically and um, that should not be denied. And for African-Americans, we hope that they will see themselves in the game uh, in that way. They certainly can harken back to it historically. And uh, they have a, a great stake in this game, just like they have a great stake in the building of our country. Uh, those are some explanation for players. I want to talk about managers for a second. Uh, digging around the New York Times, here's two quotes. Uh, this one is from Frank Robinson who passed away uh, recently, when the heat turned up a little bit, the people at the top or in position to do something make a lot of promises, but as soon as time passes and the heat goes down and it's cool again, it's business as usual, you look around and not much has been done. That's one. Here's Bob Watson. Uh, if you recall during the Jackie Robinson celebration, and that was the first one in 1997, uh, when that was the 50th anniversary. Uh, you remember Bill Clinton uh, spoke at Shea Stadium and Rachel Robinson was present for the first ceremonies. There were speeches made by people in higher positions saying that in the future, there would be a number of minorities hired in decision-making places and that hasn't taken place. This is 1999 I'm reading this quote from. And here we are, uh, I frequently recall Cito Gaston, who won back-to-back -back World Series titles, uh, never got another shot. Willie Randolph, who, who you could write his name in the lineup card for, you know, 18 years and leave him alone at second base and then went on to manage the Mets uh, through good times and bad, but overwhelmingly the record shows relatively stable uh, management role there with the Mets. Uh, never got another shot. He, he did some... Uh, base work with the Orioles, if I recall, but never got that phone call, still waiting for that phone call. A lot of uh, African-Americans who have done a, um, uh, done a fine work in Major League Baseball and uh, deserve chances at upper management and management are not getting those phone calls. Uh, and I can't, those quotes again, 1999, where are we today? Wow, well, it's, it's improving, but it certainly continues to improve at a very slow pace, as my observation. I think, too, probably even as as uh, egregious uh, as those situations, I think also in, um, in other sports, uh, like Ray Rhodes with Green Bay and Ty Willingham with Notre Dame and um, a recent coach from Texas, um, how uh, seem to be people of good character uh, and good background and good records, but uh, in those positions were just never accepted uh, to stick around in those positions. And, and it's unfortunate. Um, where are we today? Uh, uh, as I said, improving, but obviously a need to, to do more. These, um, these coaches and managers and opportunities don't come without the network of people that you can build sometimes. 
to to uh, have these opportunities. And uh, because those opportunities have not been there, uh, and it's not to say that any of those people did not earn those opportunities, they earned them uh, for their record, but uh, people who end up staying longer in other places uh, who are not uh, African-American uh, still have a network of people that they can rely on to buttress them in these positions. And that's how they stay there. Or they create these networks to be able to get different opportunities whenever possible. Uh, that network doesn't exist in the same robust way for these other candidates. And, um, um, and it's unfortunate. So uh, the, the, industry, the sports industry in general has to look itself in the mirror to see if they're sincere about it. And that, again, that does not mean that you have to put someone in a position just because they're a minority. I think the fact though that there are qualified candidates uh, who have earned that right, who have great experiences, like those those former players and managers uh, to be able to lead teams and lead them well. Uh, I think um, what uh, MLB in particular, and I won't speak for them, but I know that they're also very sensitive to this issue beyond the playing field and in upper management, uh, as well as broadening that from a gender perspective as well. Uh, so we just wanna continue to encourage them to do that and, uh, and if it means, again, teaching them the history uh, of the Negro Leagues and how those folks supported baseball, uh, we're here to help. I should have mentioned also uh, Ron Washington. Matt took the Rangers to places they had never been, two World Series in a row. Uh, I have no idea whether he is pursuing another shot at a managerial role, but uh, deserved nonetheless after uh, the incredible job in 2010 and 2011. Uh, that he did there. I want to finish, if I could, by going back uh, to the Negro League legacy and also some talk recently about um, the definition of what is or what isn't a major league and a some momentum building towards uh, making Negro League statistics official as a major league. Talk about, uh, if you could, what's happening on that front and whether or not you believe the Negro Leagues should in fact be placed up there with the American League and the National League and the Federal League, et cetera. Well, I, I've become recently aware of this discussion. It's not something that we at, here at the museum deal with a lot per se. I mean, we consider the various Negro Leagues to be major leagues regardless. So it's, it's kind of a, a discussion that really doesn't affect us very much. Um, uh, but at the same time, there is a true reality that there, no matter what others have said, there is not enough statistical data uh, for a complete uh, understanding scope of what the different Negro Leagues were. There are statistics out there. They're good statistics. They're just not enough there. What does that mean? Well, for the baseball purists, it means a lot, but uh, we consider the Negro Leagues major regardless. Um, and whether the statistics are comparable or not is really irrelevant to us. It's more about the quality of play and the quality of players. And I know in that discussion, one of the aspects of it is, uh, or well, at least one aspect of it in trying to suggest that the Negro Leagues were considered major is the number of talented players and many of them who have been elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, of which there are numerous players with Negro League uh, pedigree that are in the Hall of Fame by comparison to federal leagues and the others. So um, uh, the Negro Leagues have always been major to us. Um, I think, I know this is an important issue in the Negro Leagues historical research community. Um, and it's something that certainly is worth consideration, but we've always thought of them as major. Uh, we often have to talk about black baseball teams within the context of comparison to white baseball teams anyway, uh, which has its pluses and minuses. Um, at the same time, these stories can stand on their own. Uh, the stories of the teams and their connection to community and in the individuals, not just their prowess on the field, but their paths off the field. Some 
uh, were famous, some were infamous, some were gentlemen and great people, some were scoundrels. They were human. And uh, that's the most important thing. They need not be, uh, to get your respect, they need not be considered supermen and they need not be pitied either. Uh, we should, uh, uh, historically speaking though, as I noted earlier, it's a shame that the Negro Leagues had to exist in the first place. Uh, but thank God for the Negro Leagues as uh, uh, former Commissioner Faye Vincent had been credited to saying because then um, the talented black athlete at least had a pathway to baseball uh, as a result. Uh, uh, it, it's very possible that a Jackie Robinson could have, if he wanted to, play in the NFL. Uh, it's very possible that a Willie Mays could have played another sport. Many of these ball players played basketball. Uh, um, we would have, had it not been for the success uh, of the Negro League to nurture that talent or the success of Jackie Robinson when he came on the scene, when he came on the scene uh, to have success, uh, we would not have some of the greatest players of all time to come immediately after that. Uh, and I know the impact is strong. Uh, when you have, for example, for me, uh, working here in the museum, occasionally working in the gift shop, and a young white couple comes in with their beautiful two-year-old baby or three-year-old baby who's walking on it her own, uh, and I can say hi to that young child and, uh, and, and say, what is her name? Uh, we named her Satchel after the great Leroy Satchel Page, <laughs> and um, and and they have respect for Satchel Page and Willie Mays and the impact socially that they had um, is as important, in my opinion, more important than any stat or league designation you can make for them. Fair enough. Well, Ray, I want to thank you for coming on with us and spending some time with the Johnny and Josh podcast. That is Ray Doswell, the vice president and curator of the Negro League Museum in Kansas City, Missouri. Ray, thank you so much. Thank you.